Hey friends and welcome back to my channel. In this video we will derive the energy equation. Some recommendation first, what I would advise you to do is to pick a small booklet or some pieces of paper and take notes from time to time which will make it easier for you to grasp the concept and how we actually derive the energy equation. This will make it easier for your brain to retain the information and you will be able to recall the information in the future much easier. So with that being said, let's move on. So the fundamental equations for fluid mechanics, you know them already. We have the conservation of mass, which we already derived in the first video. Then we derived the conservation of momentum, also known as the famous Navier-Stokes equations. And in this video, we will derive the conservation of energy. So let's just recall what the conservation of mass looked like, where we said that the temporal change of mass inside the control volume is the flows into the control volume minus the flows out of the control volume. And what we derived looked something like this. We were at the change of mass and time plus the flow of mass through the boundaries equals zero. So mass is not created or destroyed. And we also said in the derivation of the mass conservation that we can change the surface integral into a volume integral by using Gauss's theorem or the so-called divergence theorem. And the conservation of momentum looked as follows. We had this equation. And by deriving everything, we got to this equation, which looked like this or in a more beautiful form, where we said that we have the Newton's second law of motion. And in a more beautiful form, we derive this equation, which really shows you that mass times acceleration equals force, which is nothing else again as Newton's second law of motion. So in this video, we will derive the conservation of energy. For that, we will also write down in words what the change looks like. So we have the temporal change of internal and kinetic energy inside again of our control volume. We will have a look again in our control volume, which is nothing else than the sum of energy flow in and out of the control volume due to the fluid flow, minus the energy flow in and out of the control volume due to heat transfer, plus work done per time by compressive, normal and shear stresses on our control volume, plus external energy input, plus work per time caused by body forces. So that's a lot. But don't worry, we will derive everything step by step. Let's first talk about what incompressible versus compressible means. So for incompressible, we can say that we can use this type of simulation for external flow aerodynamics on vehicles, for instance. We can use it for internal pipe or valve flow, which is used in the oil and water industry. And we can use incompressible flow analysis types for low speed gas flow without heat transfer. For instance, if we have air and methane, and this can be used for instance, if we simulate a ventilation duct, for instance. On the other hand, we have compressible flows. And these are for instance, flows around aircrafts or internal flows for gases, where we have high pressure or velocity. So we can say that this can be used for industrial processes. And last but not least, we can use the compressible module in our CFD solver to solve for flow at low speed, but if heat transfer is involved as well. For instance, if we have forced convection for HVAC analysis. So keep that in mind. And stick with me. We have some examples at the end where I show you where we can use the incompressible module and where to use the compressible module. I will also show an example for the Falcon Heavy and what you have to take care of if you want to simulate the Falcon Heavy and what type of field we actually have to enter, which is namely the field of aerothermodynamics, but we'll get to that at a later point. So what does compressible, the term actually mean? Compressibility is nothing else than flow is compressible if the pressure or temperature changes due to flow are large enough to cause significant density changes. So we can say that water and oil are predominantly incompressible. And we can say that gases are generally compressible, but the incompressibility assumption works at low speeds and is possible to assume. But that depends on the case, of course. And as I mentioned, if we have high pressure and temperature variations, we should use the compressible module. Please also note that compressible flow analyses are more demanding numerically. So we have additional equations that have to be solved. And we should only or we should choose this solver if it is necessary. So for compressible flow, we have a um, characteristic number where we can say up to a certain point, we can calculate 
our domain with the incompressible assumption. And if we are above this threshold, we have to use the compressible module. And that's the well-known Mach number, which is nothing else than the velocity of flow divided by the velocity of the sound. This is denoted by MA. It really depends on what literature you pick up. It's also sometimes denoted by just M equals V divided by A. And we say that gases become compressible at around Mach bigger or equal to 0.3. And we can take this as a rule of thumb and say that for the Mach number bigger or equal to 0.3, a compressible solver should be chosen for gases. And here we have our famous control volume and we do the same approach as for the mass conservation. In this case we have the energy in our control volume is that the internal energy plus the kinetic energy equals the energy in the control volume. So let's have a closer look. The internal energy is defined as rho times E times the volume and the kinetic energy as you might know from physics is rho times V squared half times the volume in this case. And if we take everything together we have the partial derivative of rho times E plus V squared divided by 2 by dt times the volume, which is our equation 1. So for the change in energies inside of our control volume, we have the following energies occurring. We have the transported internal and kinetic energy in and out of our control volume per time. And this is denoted by dE dot. We also have a transport of energy per time unit via heat transfer in and out of our control volume and this is denoted by dq dot. We also have the work per time due to compressive normal and shear stresses as mentioned in the beginning and this change is indicated by dA dot. What we also have is the energy per time coming from the outside, for instance radiation or if we have combustion processes. This change is indicated by q dot s. And we have body forces indicated by the vector k per time acting on our control volume, for instance magnetic or electric forces. This change is indicated by the power, so we have k times v times the volume. Quick recap, so we had a look at the control volume and for the mass continuity equation in this case we had some quantity coming in and some quantity going out. The same approach is chosen for the energy conservation where we said Ex comes in and Ex with the change along delta x comes out. The same goes for the other directions but for simplification purposes I have just mentioned Ex in this case. So we have the change of internal and kinetic energy right here. So for Ex we pick Ex now. We have that Ex equals rho times E plus V squared half times U times dy dz. The same goes for the other directions. If we have a look at the change, we have the same quantity by dx times dx. So it's the same approach as for the mass conservation as well as for the momentum conservation. So if we take this all together for dE dot, we have the same approach as for the other equations. So we take the term that goes in minus the term that goes out times the surface, of course, which it goes through. We do this for all three spatial directions and we end up with the following equation as you can see on the slide and some terms drop out which is indicated right here and what we end up with is this beautiful equation right here. This is equation two. For the energy transport, namely heat transfer, we pick something called Fourier's law which you might also know, maybe you know it from thermodynamics, physics or maybe if you worked with finite elements where you also take this approach for heat transfer and there we have that the heat flux q dot is nothing else than minus lambda where lambda is the thermal conductivity times dt by dx and the minus is just here to indicate that the gradient goes from higher to lower temperatures so this is and we just take this minus to confirm this thermodynamical axiom if you want so we have here again the energy balance which looks like this and terms again drop out as you can see and we end up with equation 3 which also looks very beautiful which is dq dot so we move on. We have now the work per time balance and this as you might remember maybe is dA dot. Now we do it for the x direction so we do the balance as you can see and what we end up with is the equation on the bottom. 
So some things drop out again and we end up with the equation as you can see on the very bottom. We do this for all three spatial directions and we end up with equation 4, 5 as well as 6. Please again quick note here, please take your time and take notes from time to time and try to understand each term as good as possible. And if you find any mistakes, maybe there are some mistakes, but I quadruple checked everything. But if you find any flaws in, in the logic of the derivation, feel free to reach out to me and leave a comment down below. I'm very happy to help you out. So if we assemble the equations right now, we remember what we said at the beginning where we have this lengthy equation and, and if we have it in word, in word form, and then we just drop every term in and this is our equation seven. So what we can do is to put in our Stokes hypothesis, which we, which I explained a bit more in the derivation of the momentum equation, so the Navier-Stokes video. You can have a look at that again, but that's what you end up with right here. It becomes a bit lengthy. These terms drop out. So the first term that you can see that drops out, drops out due to continuity. And the other terms, you will see right now why they drop out. I will just tell you why they drop out and not meticulously derive how the equations drop out and what you have to multiply with what and show you it step by step. Otherwise, we'll sit there until tomorrow. So these are the terms that also vanish. So it's not the first term is not included. We only have the remaining five terms. So these remaining five terms are put right here. And what can you do to make them vanish? What you do is you have to recall from the Navier-Stokes equations the following equations for the x, y, and z direction. What you then do is to multiply these equations with u, v, and w respectively, and then you add the equations and subtract them from equation 7. And equation 7 is this one right here. And that's how the terms drop out. So that's a cool exercise that you can do, maybe in your free time, or if you're curious how it works out. But the final equation that we end up with is the following which looks very beautiful, and this is our equation 8. You can rewrite it in a bit more beautiful form, and what you have is this ominous term, phi, and what is phi? Phi is nothing else than the dissipation function, and if you are interested in how to derive this dissipation function, I don't do it in this video, and it's not very relevant, I would say, but if you want more information, you can have a look at this link. So are we done? And if I ask this question, of course, we are not done because the energy equations which we derived are for homogeneous flows and Newtonian mediums. So what other approaches can we choose? Let's say we want to use the approach for perfect gas. And as you might remember, for perfect gas, the specific heat capacities Cp and Cv are not a function of the temperature. And as you might know from thermodynamics, we have these equations. So we have E equals Cv times T as well as the enthalpy equals E plus P divided by rho equals Cp times T. And rewriting this is nothing else than E equals Cp times T minus P divided by rho. And we put this into equation 9. And what we end up with is the final form for a perfect gas, which looks like this. So as promised, now some cool examples. Here we have the external flow aerodynamics case. In this case, not around a car, but around a Formula 1 car which has been simulated using SimScale. So for this case, we can use the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equation in its simplest form. The viscosity is not depending on the temperature, so we have no temperature changes involved right here. Of course, you might argue now, okay, the tires, for instance, generate heat, and maybe you can include that in your simulation, but that's I would say cherry picking and it really depends on what you want to simulate. But in a general case, let's say you want to simulate the flow around a Tesla car, for instance, then you can of course use the incompressible flow module in your CFD tool. What we end up with are four equations with four unknowns. So we solve for U, V, W as well as pressure. And as you might know from mathematics or as we know from mathematics, if we have four equations and four unknowns, this should be solvable, which is true. But when it comes to implementing this whole solution schemes, etc., this might be a bit tricky, but we will discuss this in a future video where I tell you a little bit more about how to discretize these equations, etc. 
Moving on, we have something called a torque converter, which you might know if you are a car enthusiast. We can say that the flow inside of this converter is incompressible. However, the oil is subjected to temperature differences. So mu and rho are not constant. So what we have to do is to take the energy equation into account. So we have five equations with five unknowns. So UV, W, the pressure as well as the temperature. And this whole method is iterative. So what does it mean? So of course, as I mentioned, we have to solve the energy equation to determine the temperature distribution in our fluid domain. With that, we can determine the density and viscosity distribution. And with iterative, I mean that at the beginning of the calculations, we estimate the density and viscosity distribution in our domain. And this will be calculated using the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equations. Then by using the energy equations, which we derived, the temperature distribution will be calculated and will be compared to the density and viscosity values that we assumed, and those will be corrected. And this whole procedure continues until the density and the viscosity distribution is not changing anymore. So that's a general procedure. And as I mentioned, we will talk about this in the future on how to actually solve these whole equations. For the next case, we have a look at the compressible flow around an airfoil. So it's a bit more complex. There, U, V, W and pressure as well as the density have to be solved as well. We have the energy equation again that has to be taken into account. So we have again five equations with five unknowns. And the density can be calculated using the ideal gas law, which is nothing else than P equals rho times R times T. At the end, we will have a look at hot compressible flow. In this case, we will have a look at the Falcon Heavy. So for that, we have, of course, Mach number, which are way bigger than one. Thus, the perfect gas assumption is no longer valid. So we can use the equation nine as we have derived it. And we also have to make some assumptions about the internal energy, viscosity, and thermal conductivity, and derive them from other thermodynamical relations. This is a beautiful field, which is called aerothermodynamics. And this will also be covered in a future video series or video, where I talk about that you also have to take into account chemical processes that take place at very high temperatures, for instance, ionization of gases. So stay tuned for that. With that being said, we are already at the end of the video for potential video topics. As always, feel free to vote down in the comment section. We can talk about turbulence, what forms of the Navier-Stokes equation exist, and how to derive a simple analytical case that we can derive in a, in a quick video. We can talk about the very important topic of wall functions, what is Y plus. Also, again, the suggestion that we have a look at stability criteria using MATLAB, how to properly manage a CFT project, and hashtag Simulation Sunday, which is already planned. So stay tuned for that as well. And as always, you can download the slides with additional benefits from my Patreon page. Sources are given right here. And with that being said, we are at the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate your support. It's just overwhelming. And I would say, as always, smash the like button. Comment please down in the comment section because the algorithm favors videos which have a lot of comments. And share the video with your friends who might benefit from it. And see you in the next one. And as always, do not forget to keep engineering your mind. Peace.